Hi, friends. Max Elage here. On this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, we have Mike McGoldrick on. This is one of our longest episodes, and I was super excited to get Mike's whole athletic and coaching history in his 12 years of CrossFit and all the lessons he's learned along the way. If you're on the go and you want to listen to just the audio version, subscribe to the Corpus Animus podcast on your favorite podcast app. Get better at the sport of CrossFit alongside some of the best athletes in the world in our online training program, The Design. Head over to our website, trainingthinktank.com backslash DSGN to learn more. They are interrupting <laughs> each other regularly. Chris constantly derails to tell a dick joke. <laughs> Someone's got to tell it. But like, to me, it's like normal, everyday conversation. Yeah, this is just life. Yeah. All right, we're rolling. Speaking of life. Speaking of life, Mike, tell me when you were born. Let's start, let's start with your origin story. <laughs> well, it starts all the way back. Actually, uh, based on the stories you tell of when I qualified for the games, I was actually, I was actually qualified for the games before I was born. In 1900? Yeah, 1937. Mike training for CrossFit. 1937 or 1976? 76. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, I'd have just been creeping back. Yeah. Well, so the purpose of this podcast is to dig deeper into your athletic history as a CrossFitter and then, I guess, give people some lessons and valuable insights as to what you've learned along your path. If there is any. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck, people. Uh, so let's start with when you found, well, actually start with your athletic history and training history before mm. you got into CrossFit. How I feel far like, back? Well, just like high school. Okay. Uh, the first time I ever back squatted <laughs> was the first day of freshman football training. And I remember being so ridiculously sore <laughs> the next day that we went in. They had us all max out. What'd you hit? Freshman high school. Oh, maybe 225. Okay. Um, no, that's not that's not true. There's no way I back squat at 225. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Anyways, we maxed out. It was awful. It was terrible. No instruction. We go in the next day and they have us ma like maxing out sets of 10. <laughs> oh I mean, God. like dudes, 10 RMs. dudes are crippling. Like I can yeah. barely walk. And he's like, we're back squatting today. And I'm like, I can't like tie my shoes. Yeah. Why are we doing this? Yeah. yeah it was really ugly. So I would, I'd say like, so good instruction right from the beginning. Yeah. I would say like just before that, I wanted to start getting in like shape and I actually started working out. I got a membership at like a, you were a bigger gym. kid, right? I was, I was pretty heavy. I was a little overweight. Um, from like, middle school days going into high school and like, I don't know, like a switch flipped one day. Maybe I just wanted to like, hit puberty. And I, you hit want puberty. To I want to start meeting girls. <laughs> what, was her, what was her name? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> you can't talk about it. There he goes again. Yeah. Derailing the train of thought. <laughs> the one man peanut gallery. Um, her name was Brandy. Brandy. I just hadn't yep. known that I was going to meet her yet. Yeah, Sure. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, like a little bit of like bodybuilding type stuff. I remember going to like, uh, I think it was a world's gym in Memphis back in the day. And like, I think this was like a hot spot for like big drug users. Mm. Cause there were like massive dudes in there and I'm like going up trying to figure out how to work out and I'm like stopping them in the middle of their set being like, man, what do you do to get these? Like, how are you so big? And they're like, one dude barely spoke English. He was like Eastern European and yeah. you know, they just like kind of blew me off. But I would say like, that's where training started. And then I wanted to, I didn't really like football. I was playing hockey at the time. Like that was my passion sport. Um, but being in the South, there's no strength conditioning for hockey. Um, it's a smaller sport in the South. So I joined the football team to basically use like all the strength conditioning. And I just got like my ass tore up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, hard workouts. Like I remember every day going and like, again, like I'm overweight when, when starting this, I was like 210 pounds in eighth grade. You were yeah, that big. I was, oh. I was pretty big. Oh, yeah. yeah. You were a little and, chunker. Uh, I mean, over a course of like three months, I lost like 45 pounds. Yeah. Um, we so did like, it at the same time. I was the same eighth yeah. grade to ninth grade. Yeah. I mean, it was brutal though, because I went in and they were like, you're all right. He's overweight. You're a lineman. <laughs> and I lost like 45 pounds in three months. because I was like eating well, I was like running, doing all these things. And they just kept me in the lineman. And, <laughs> they just thought you were <laughs> And I mean, I was not good. At, I was not good at football. You know, I was like second, third string. They didn't really give a shit. Yeah. You know, like all right, we're going to like coach these kids, but like, we know who the players are. We're going to put more attention into them. And like, um, I just was just getting tore up and I was like, all right, I'm not excelling at this. These guys have been playing together, like through youth leagues yeah. for like years. And I just don't love the sport. Um, and it, but it made me like, it helped hockey a lot. Like I, I came back like after going into high school and was just like in really good shape. And then like, I just, I was addicted to training. I remember being in practices and I was like that asshole on the team that was like, come on, let's do more sprints, let's do more ladders oh, and no, stuff. I hated, and every, oh, yeah. I hated that At guy. that age, everyone was like, dude, shut up. Like, yeah. we're tired. We want to go home now. And I'm like, come on, let's, you know, it's like yeah. skate the mile or whatever. Yeah. What uh, happened now? You're the opposite. 
Now, <laughs> now, I do now, the now you're like, of work. oh, let's do 20 minutes of rest here. <laughs> Brandon's like, no, five seconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have my days. Some days I do. It depends what we're doing. Yeah. We'll get to that. I think, I think a lot of that is conserving my energy now. Yeah, I was back, just kidding. Yeah. Back then it was like an abundance of energy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think going into high school, like that was kind of the big spark of training and like, that was like a defining moment and really having belief in myself being really young was like, okay, I took control of this weight problem. And like, that was like a massive confidence boost. And I started training really hard. I figured out I was actually kind of good at exercising. I was always like, probably the more like harder working on the team, maybe not the most talented, but I was definitely someone that like, didn't mind doing extra work to train hard and like try and get in better shape. Yeah. So that was your background into college. And then you, did you do? Yeah, I played in, I played in the college, um, on a club team at MTSU. It was somewhat competitive. I would say like club is not NCAA, but it was, um, the team we had, we had a bunch of guys that were, you know, out of juniors, um, coming down that were basically wanting to start their college career. And, we had a really good team. Actually, like a cool story. Um, my freshman year playing, um, we had, it was the year of the NHL lockout and basically all the coaches are out of work at the time. So Brent Peterson, um, came down, he was the associate BP? coach, <laughs> BP, <laughs> different BP, uh, Brent Peterson came down. He was the associate coach of the national predators. His son was on our team. He was a complete stud. He came down and coached us for a season. So it was like an amazing experience having an NHL coach come down and coach our yeah, that college team. Cool. It was really awesome. And yeah. like seeing, I mean, I've had good coaches growing up that had a lot of influence on me in sport, but seeing a professional coach and how he gains the attention of the entire room by doing so little, was just like a very powerful thing and amazing thing. And it was actually like, was a big influence on me on how I want to coach people. Yeah. Um, I've also noticed <clears throat> if you meet somebody like that, the attention to detail that they have is so much higher and it makes you perceive everything differently. Like yeah. you, you talk to an NFL coach or somebody who played in the NFL and then you start to actually see the game differently. It's like, Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I was focused on so many other different things. I was paying attention to the wrong details. Things that probably aren't going to help the situation or, or aren't something that you necessarily need to work on in the moment. But obviously with him being an NHL coach, you trust his opinion and his guidance but then also something that I noticed with a difference of a high level coach like that is the expectations that they set for everyone. Like when he sets an expectation, one, you're expected to do it. And two, you believe that it can be done because you trust his, yeah, um, he, his guidance he set on the it. Yeah, right. Yeah. You don't trust the coach and they set an expectation. You're not always a hundred percent on board. So like it was really easy. And he like, I mean, we went, we basically lost one game the entire season. Like we had an amazing season and like, we weren't the best team and it was just a really cool experience. Awesome. Quack, so you were quack. <laughs> <laughs> so you were a hockey player and then what's the, where, where'd you find CrossFit? What's so, the story? Yeah. So, workout? um, I had a series of sol uh, shoulder injuries playing hockey. I had a couple of AC separations. If you see my right shoulder, if you've ever seen it, like it looks like the clavicle is sticking out like an inch above the shoulder. Um, I strained and separated that joint like several times. And I think my senior year, I'd done it like four times and I was like, all right, like, I'm just really kind of tired of this. And Were they impact all like hitting every time I hit someone? <clears throat> yeah. Um, one time it happened when I like went into the boards, but every other time I would go to hit someone and it would just drop. And I'm like, oh, there it is. Yeah. I mean, one of the worst experiences we were playing, um, I don't remember what college it was. It was a Michigan team and it's freezing you know, it's in the middle of winter and we're up there and I, I separate my shoulder and I have to go to the locker room and basically undress myself. And I like, and like when you separate, have you ever had an AC separation? No. All the muscles around contract to kind of protect it. And it's just extremely painful. So everything kind of seizes up. You're in a full cramp. Basically. I'm in like a full cramp. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> my cramping. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in the locker room trying to undress myself and there's no hot water and I'm taking a cold shower and I'm like, all right, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> I've had it. I'm done. I'm pretty tired of this. It's a pretty miserable experience. But anyway, so like rehab process started for that. I kind of like hung up the skates at that point and decided to, you know, just train and have some fun and enjoy like the last part of my senior career. Um, so that got into just training because what happens when you quit playing competitive sport, you start to get out of shape and you want to remain in somewhat of a competitive level on things. And, um, I remember doing workouts with my roommate at the time, um, Adam Valentine, he's a exercise science major and runs a business in Murfreesboro, a personal training business, really sharp dude was always doing different training progressions. He was really big into bodybuilding back then. And I remember doing like widow maker back squat sets with him mm. and I was getting a little Is better audience. What that is. 
Um, I mean, I don't remember the exact details of them, but I remember we would work up to like a heavy three by five and then we would end with like sets of 10, like drop sets where they were just like yeah. the puking back squat sets. Yeah, Widowmaker just refers to the fact that you're about to die doing the back yeah. squats. I mean, I remember like sets of like 15 and 20. It was just awful. Yeah. Like, um, but I like loved it. I don't know why I wasn't really getting that much stronger, but I love the fact that we were like on the verge of puking doing these <laughs> and like something about that just got me kind of hooked. Like I wasn't there to really get bigger. I didn't really care that much. I wanted to beat these guys. Like yeah. I wanted to like get stronger than them. So like that was what hooked me. And then little things, like I wanted to just start running to the gym some. I was riding my bike a lot more and I started just kind of mixing things up. I was like basically doing CrossFit at the time without even knowing what it was. And you hadn't ever heard about it before. Never heard of CrossFit. Um, I actually like the Jim Jones workout came out. Oh yeah. That the, time. Was that the 300? Yep. Yeah. I yep. think that's how I first heard of CrossFit as well. And I remember doing it and like, I don't think I finished it. I think I got super sick after doing it. There's a, along this, this story, you'll hear a lot about throwing up. <laughs> like I threw up puking, cramping. Yeah. The, um, the first gym I started, I'd actually like, they were calling me puke and Mike. Cause it was just like, <laughs> it was just a thing. Like it was just normal routine. Like we do a workout, Mike throws up, we come back the next day. Yeah. But anyway, so like that was kind of the first experience with like mixed hard training. And, uh, that's where I really got hooked because I was like trying to race these guys and I was actually able to beat them in that. Cause I yeah. didn't have like the strength numbers that they did. You yeah. know, like, I couldn't do like sets of three fifteen back squat at the time. So anyways, that, that was really fun. And it kind of like opened the door for me to start getting interested in like training and the science and like just really just paying attention to like what actually makes you better. Yeah. Um, and then like a little bit of the sport mix of it. And then where did that lead you to actually find CrossFit? So the and same guy, Adam, my, my college roommate at the time, um, he was a personal trainer at a velocity sports performance. I don't know if you remember those. Yeah, but they, they were like sport performance places. Yeah, they were. Yeah. There was a big chain of them. I know there were several in the Nashville area. I don't. I'm, it might have been nationwide too. Um, he trained out of those and was training like some you know athletes and stuff. And um, he was like, "Hey, man, there's these guys that do this little thing in the corner that ran out of small space. It's called like CrossFit or something. I think you would like it." Yeah, like, <laughs> they just he knew right. He knew away. right away yeah. when he saw these dudes doing it. He knew I was just like would. Yeah. Didn't mind running my head into a wall. Yeah. So I went and met these guys. It was, uh, the, it was CrossFit Murfreesboro. It was like the start of it. And uh, like the first day, this the, the typical CrossFit story. Like, all right, we're going to run you through Fran. And I remember just being like, yeah, I'm going to show these guys. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And then I think like a month after getting into- What was into, your time on Fran? I think I did like a pseudo tipping strictish pull up. And I want to say like nine minutes or did something. Did you throw up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Definitely threw up. <laughs> threw up the next day too. It's, next, am, it's amazing thinking about that as like not a hard workout now. Like imagine you did Fran in nine minutes right now. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that was yeah. Fun. yeah, I know. Yeah. I was pretty wrecked after it. I remember, I mean, I have the log book of all my first training sessions still. Like, all of them? Yeah. I've got three notebooks. Oh, I man. wrote down everything, full detail, RPE scales, how it felt like my times on them. And for a while, that's how I trained myself in CrossFit. I would, I had like 45 days worth of workouts and I would repeat them. And I would constantly huh. see if I could get better. And I did that for a while. Then I started realizing, okay, you have weaknesses you need to train specifically. Cause like I wasn't ever doing double unders and things like that. Um, so I, I would say like, I never was on like a consistent training program. I was training myself for a long time, even though I had just kind of started it. What year was this? 2008, nine, this would be 1972. <laughs> yeah, right, no. right before the games. <laughs> this was 2008. Yeah. Um, so by that point, yeah. I'd say like several months into it, Evan, the guy who owns CrossFit Murfreesboro was like, Hey, they do this thing called the games where you like compete at this stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yes. I'm in. And I went and it was in the Midwest regional. You went what year? That was the 2009. 2009. Uh, it was sectionals. No. Oh, sectionals that was, was the, in the 2010. Yeah. Yeah. That was like, you had a regional qualifier. You could just go to and yep. then go right to it. Yep. I just okay. signed up and went. And it was at Rogue. It was at Rogue uh, headquarters in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I drove up with my buddy Kyle. I didn't sleep the night before. There was like a college basketball team in the hotel room keeping me up. I'm losing my mind. Like I was like like always nervous before competitions and games and stuff like this. Like I always had an issue. Just Mike's like, a little high strung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, had a, I had a really hard time calming my nerves and, and relaxing a little bit like before performance. And um, 
anyways, I basically got like two hours of sleep that night. It got to the point where I wasn't falling asleep the night before the competition. So I drank NyQuil. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Lessons, oh, man. No. Lessons. Yeah. I, I mean, I passed yeah. out, right? Yeah. Like it knocked me out, but I woke up the next day and was like, oh, oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> hung over. And the first workout, I'll never forget it. It was so gross. It was... 21, oh, 21, I thought you were going to forget it. No. <laughs> 21, 15, nine, 275 deadlifts and chest to bar pull-ups. Oh, that's a this, tough one. All these workouts at this regional were just short and yeah. nasty. I look and, back now and I'm like licking my chops. Yeah, at yeah. It, but. And they're all different from every, like back in the day, right? It was yeah, different yeah. in every single one of them. Yeah. I don't know who wrote these, but they were individual per regional. I mean, that was a beat down. I, I threw up like blue yeah. after that workout. <laughs> Threw up your NyQuil? Yeah, threw it, it was just disgusting. I felt awful. I felt toxic. If you ever have trouble sleeping, like, just don't sleep. <laughs> yeah. Just whatever you do, don't take NyQuil. Yeah. Like, it's not worth getting just the two hours. Like, I mean, there's a ton of competitors that don't sleep the night before yeah. their I, first come. You've talked about Noah having issues with that. Yeah, and, like, and I just, like, just lay there. Like, just relax. Yeah. I think I think that's the first thing that I've learned is just learning to accept. All right, you're probably not going to sleep tonight. It's going to be really bad. And then all of a sudden, just the, the mindset, the shift is a lot better. Yeah. It's not so much now, like you trying to be in control of it. Yeah. The anxiety of thinking I'm not sleeping. I need to be sleeping is worse than just not sleeping. It's the worst it's game just, in the world. Like, just lay there. Yep. You'll be fine. Yep. Might as well just go do something else. Yep. So next workout, I mean, we won't talk too, yeah, too yeah. much in detail, but just because they're nasty, it was like five rounds for time of like 11 double kettlebell thrusters and like 10 burpees. Ooh, that's I a mean, tough one. Too. It was all, yeah. it was nasty. And then the third, a two K row. Oh, <laughs> I mean, no. it was like beat bam, down bam, after bam. beat down after beat down in seven minutes. Oh man. And then the next day, 30 clean and jerks, run 430 power snatch. Ooh, that's a or tough 30 one power too. snatch, run 430 clean and jerk. It was just gross. But like, again, like looking back, I'm yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah, now they'd like be good. Perfect yeah. powerhouse workout. So yeah, I mean, so that was like the first CrossFit competition experience. Ooh, any names at that? Uh... Yeah, Graham Holmberg, Spencer Hendel. Um, I mean, a few others, if I went back and looked, Rory Hanlon was at that oh, one, yeah, I nice. think. I remember thinking like, that dude is huge. Yeah, gorilla. Yeah. It was funny. Like, I mean, I remember watching like guys like Graham and Spencer compete. And I mean, the thing that I realized I was, I, where I was at, I was like probably one of the fitter ones at, at CrossFit and like doing things, but these dudes just looked next level compared to everyone at that time. They knew how to move well. There wasn't moving. They couldn't do. They just were like really clean. Yeah. Um, they were just so much more efficient. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, at that time, the sport is so new that it's really about like who can do the movements really well versus who can't do the movements at all. Yeah. And it wasn't even really about pacing that much. It wasn't even really about like pure capacity. It was just like skill Yeah, at that time. Yeah. So. It's weird how the evolution has happened in that, like watching the sport evolve, how it became like movements and then pacing. And then it just keeps evolving to be something different. Now it's like, how fast can you move and how little can you rest? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, doing like silly things like, all right, we're going to figure out how to make this thruster faster by widening our feet and Widening our shorting hands. The, like, yeah, shortening like, the depth by one inch. If you would have told me a decade ago, man, a decade ago. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> if you would have told me a decade ago that like we're gonna try and figure out how to do these movements faster, I would have been like, What? That doesn't yeah. even make sense. Like, yeah. How can you do that? So So where'd you finish in that comp? Oh, I didn't even make it to day two. Oh, you got cut. I got cut. So uh, they they cut you after day one. And then I remember in, <laughs> 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 I was so destroyed. I haven't eaten. I've done nothing but throw up all day. <laughs> you know, like I feel like I'm yeah. a survivalist. You're like, tough. Yeah. yeah. I would have been like, I'm done. I'm yeah. done with CrossFit. I'm definitely in like a caloric deficit. Like, um, I remember at the end of the day, they like bring everyone around like a, like a football team yeah. selection and they're like announcing who made it. And I was 31. Oh, and they made 30 oh, and I was no. like, darn, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, crap, yeah. Uh, better luck next year. Yeah. I was actually like, oh, yeah, you God, were okay. Man, I'm yeah. hurting. Yeah. Like, I just want to go sleep. I slept so good that night. Yeah. But did I came back to eat pizza. I did. I actually did eat pizza. Yeah. Um, but I came back the next day and watched the guys. And that's when I was like, I hate this feeling. Mm. Like I really want to be out there, especially that workout. I was like, this is unfulfilling right now. So yeah. it was like a good little bit of like motivation. And like, I mean, I think I took a half a day off and went right back to training. Nice. <laughs> yep. And then basically it started from there. So that was like the start of the competitive CrossFit journey. So what was, so 2010, 11, what was your, where'd you go to training wise? So you were coaching yourself. You went back and kept coaching yourself. 
Yeah. So I went back, I mean, not doing workouts with these guys, but always doing extra stuff and just really looking at what are the things that are holding me back, just paying attention to weaknesses. Now it's, it was less about like getting a hard workout in for the day and moving on with life. It was like, I want to be really good at this. How much extra can I be doing right now and adding to my day? And like, that's where it was pretty much consuming. Yeah. At that point I'm grad, I'm graduating. I finished the mechanical engineering degree and I'm, I've got a job set up. So um, the work hours were very lenient and I had the ability to train a lot. You were um, doing thrusters at your desk. I actually, dude, I was doing crazy stuff because I was a traveling sales rep and I would, there were days where I would literally one, I would have to pack my food and like carry it on the road with me, which was kind of unheard of back in the day yeah. going to subway and having like pulling out a scale and having them measure out the deli meat so I could follow my, um, <laughs> Hit your macros, no, 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 not macros blocks blocks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so doing stuff like that, but I was, I would, there were sessions where I would pull over on the side of the road and I had stuff with me and I would work out like on the side of the highway Wow, just to get like an hour session in. I was addicted to basically not doing only one session a day. Yeah. <laughs> addicted to hard work. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. Like that's all I was doing at that time. I was like, I had little responsibility. I had plenty of time to work and I just had an abundance of energy basically. So I was getting in everything I could. And at that point it was like, even if it wasn't skill-based, it was just tons of capacity work too, because at that point I'm starting to discover, okay, I'm definitely more limited by my like breathing and Metcon than I am in some of the strength because it was just starting to come more naturally at that point. You just started to get stronger. Yeah. Like every, I, I, w I was never on like consistent strength progressions. I would just touch on stuff for a while. And every time I revisited it, it was a lot better and mm -hmm. just kept getting a lot better and a lot better. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, the Metcons are what people are beating me in. No one's ever beating me in the strength stuff at this point. So just keep doing more Metcons. Yeah. And then um, you went to, did you compete 2010, 2011, 2012, and you just kept trying to make the games? Yeah. So each year I, I was just getting a little bit better at it. Right. So to, I, at that point I moved back to Memphis. I found the guys at CrossFit Memphis. This is where I met Mike Bledsoe and Doug and they, they, and Chris and Chris. Well, I hadn't known Chris yet. Chris comes years later. Uh, well, I came in in 2009, but I don't think we ever like yeah. I saw you in the room and I was like, I'm going to avoid that, that, <laughs> that crowd. <laughs> were we, were we just going crazy? That was when you were in your like puke and Mike, like, yeah, I remember them telling me like, yeah, we caught the, it probably didn't say it that way, but you know, puke and Mike over there. <laughs> yeah. No way. Yeah. yeah and I remember being like, oh, yeah. hell no. Yeah. Were you like, oh my God, are you going to puke on me? Yeah. No, nah, I don't know about that, but oh, yeah, I was like, I don't want to hang with that crowd. <laughs> yeah. So I now look at you. Um, that was a, that was a really good move. I remember like going and knocking on the door and like CrossFit Memphis back in the day was like a dungeon. Like it was like cinder block walls and like this old car shop and not it on was the best street either. Not on the best street. It was in the hood. Yeah. I mean, it was, but it was awesome. I like, feel like that was a lot of the original CrossFit. Yeah, They've yeah. become more commercialized now, but that was like, it was a draw. It a yeah, bit. it was a draw. Yeah, like it was. It was, just, a, it, the like if it was clean, it was you would have been under, depressed. Yeah. It was an underground scene, like watching like the Jim Jones days where it was like just primitive, basic stuff, chains, rust, yeah. dirty bars. Like you yeah. just liked it. I, I was know. used to that with wrestling culture because wrestling is a very poor sport. Like all you need is a singlet, headgear, shoes, and generally there's no funding. So you're like, oh, where's the wrestling room? They're like, oh, they put the mats in the basement to practice. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Like yeah. it's just a kind of a, that kind of underground culture and CrossFit kind of had some of that yeah. earlier. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So meeting these guys was really good because one, they like, they opened the door for me to just train whenever I wanted. Like right away I came in and I remember the first day I knock on the door and Mike's like, yeah, yeah, you can, you can join, come in. And then like, he like ran me through some stuff to see what I could do. And he's like, all right, you're good. You're good. Do whatever you want. <laughs> and I was like, thanks man. And, uh, Perfect. At, at that point they, they kind of like took my hand and like started like teaching me about training. Like they were, they had just pretty much finished school and like getting their masters in kinesiology. And uh, I don't remember what other fields, but they understood training and had a lot of background in like martial arts and gymnastics. And they just opened the door to a bunch of different areas of training that I haven't gone down for more specific improvement on things. So I remember Mike helping me learn more about gymnastics programs. Like he was turning me on to Sommer stuff back in the day. Yeah. Um, pose running drills that actually train running better instead of just doing more hard work with it. Yeah. Um, Doug just teaching me more about energy systems and smart program design. So it was like a really big influence at that time. And that was where I got into like designing things and coaching people and just getting really just trying to up the craft a little bit. So you were coaching yourself, but it sounds like you were pretty coachable pretty early often. What, what allowed you to kind of dictate who you would listen to and who, how you would source information? Cause I feel like 
that's a lot of things with novices. They get into something, especially if they're novices with a little bit of talent. Yeah. They could either be resistant to listen to anybody that they don't perceive as better than them, or they're so open to listening to information from other people that sometimes they're listening to just bad advice. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes you, one, you can just get a read on someone. You're like, all right, I trust what this person is saying right now. They sound like they have enough information to back this up. So it, they convince you. Yeah. The other is like, you need some trust sometimes because if you're, that's just part of the learning process. You have to be willing and open to learn new things. And these guys opened the door and saw, they were able to point out things they saw that they thought I could improve in that I hadn't thought of yet. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And I really want to get better at this. So I'm going to listen. I mean, I was bugging the piss out of these dudes all the time. Like, help yeah. me write this program. Help me do this. Help me do this. Help me do this. And like all the time, like, Hey, how's my technique on this? How's my technique on this? I was like, yeah. you probably were, super you annoying. Started as the annoying kid who would push people in practices to do more conditioning yeah. and then moved into the annoying adult to, to yeah. help you, people get you better. It's not as annoying when it's a young kid doing it, but when it's a grown adult <laughs> doing it, it's super annoying. <laughs> I think I'm like that too. Yeah. So I would, I would say that was the big influence on just getting more involved in mixed training principles. So when did you find the OPT community? Cause I know at some point I became aware of you and I, when I was, I was still in 2011 mm -hmm. and 10, I was still in like a competitive mind state yeah. and I was looking at all the other strong guys that were posting on there and trying to put up the biggest strength numbers. And that was just like, or anything that came out that was short and your name was always one of the ones that popped up. Ah, um, 2010, I think, I think I remember finding the community maybe a few months before the 2010 regional mm -hmm. and I think I had reached a point where I knew what I need, needed to be better at, but I was hitting plateaus on certain things. Like I didn't know how to train muscle ups and Metcons to be better at them. I knew how to get better at the skills individually. I was doing gymnastics programs. I just, and I was doing weightlifting programs. I'd followed catalyst athletic cycle, like very religiously, like mornings looked like all catalyst athletics training midday. I would go for lunch and I would do uh, gymnastics work. And then PM would be Metcon. Like mm -hmm. it was like that every day. And it got to a point though, where I didn't know how to mix them. And I noticed that it all, it wasn't really helping my CrossFit workouts, uh, to the, to the level that I wanted it to, I got better at the skills individually. I could do cool gymnastics tricks, but I'm like, this isn't helping me do, do better like, in open style yeah, workouts. Do five rounds of 10 and something else. Yeah, exactly. So I just researching online and I was, I saw OPT's program and I was like, this looks like unlike anything I've ever seen, but it's also looks like good structured training where we're still working on skills. Like there's like an A, a B, a C, and then a Metcon. Like you didn't see that much yeah. yet. It was mostly point. just like build to a max something and a Metcon. Like yeah. That was most of the structure of what people were yeah. putting out publicly. Yeah. Or just seeing strength <laughs> designs of like kipping ring dips into touch and go power cleans or like energy system work on the air dime. Like we do, he was, um, yeah. James used to write like a ton of that stuff. So, um, that was when I saw that. And I think I hopped into a couple of workouts, like right before going to regionals and then regionals, I like completely underperformed. This is in 2010. And like, I just remember being like really pissed off. Like it was one of those where I probably had like an attitude and annoyed a lot of people. But I think if you're a competitive person, you don't really give a shit. Like, that's just what it is to you. Like you go in and you don't have fun. If you underperform, you're like, yeah. this is stupid. Like, I don't want to be here right now. Like yeah, it like, was a really bad, it was a bad experience. Like and, the rich, Groaning, being taken second and being on the podium and yeah. Yeah. People are like, I don't understand his attitude. And I'm like, you wouldn't understand. Like <laughs> he's got a champion's mindset and like, he's just not happy because he knows that there was more work to be done. And like, that was an underperformance. So, um, that was the, that you wouldn't understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, whatever, not to sound like a dick, but I mean, it's, it's I like the truth. It. Yeah. 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 So, um, was after the year you fell down on those, uh, was it overhead squats? No, that was no, the next year. Um, so at that point, um, I'm like, all right, I need to get a little more methodical and targeted with my training because I just like, again, an underperformance in this community was, had really good people in it. Like, uh, like Nate Schrader was doing some of it. Rory was AJ in. AJ was in there. Yeah. And Matt Baird. There was yeah. a, a guys, lot of people that were pretty competitive. Yeah. Guys that I started to like hear about and look up to. And I'm like, all right, like I watched Rory compete and I'm like, well, he's got, you know, like really high strength levels. Anyways, it was just good targets to chase and yeah. like a, a good community of smart training. So I hopped on there and was pretty like consistent with that. And then hold on, let me put a caveat on that. Cause that's pre social media being big too. Like, I mean, Facebook may have been around a yeah. little bit, but like 
So that must've felt really cool to have some like training interaction online. It was, it was Whereas cool. Now I mean, you say it, it's like, okay, but like back then it was kind of like, it was, it was the blog. Days, it yeah. was just straight up a website and you posted comments and like you just fueled all the comments yeah. through there. It's funny. I, <clears throat> that was the first time I realized the real value of a competitive culture to be a part of year round. Cause like you go to a competition and I think the first CrossFit competition that I did was sectionals mm -hmm. in South Florida in 2010. And I remember there was a max shoulder to overhead and it was like on a slanted platform or a slanted, uh, driveway or a uh, parking lot yeah. with those just normal stand up racks. Like there were no blocks, nothing. And it was just a shoulder to overhead. I have no idea what my max shoulder to overhead at the time was yeah. probably like 275 as a push press. And they're like, Oh, you can put it on up on your back. And I was like, Oh, is uh -huh. that better? And like, yeah, you could do back rack. And I remember hitting 315. And I was like, <laughs> Oh my God. Like, and the the power of competition. He's on drugs. <laughs> yeah. That's what everyone thought yeah, back then. Probably, yeah. But the power of competition brought out so much out of you. Yeah. And having that on a regular basis with all of your training numbers, like the that yeah. community was the first time that I really realized it. And I think it was one of the reasons why circling back to the design was such a, a good thing for my own like, all right, I'm going to get back into training and I need numbers of people that are around me and way better than me and worse than me so that there could be some sort of community mentorship because it was yeah. so valuable to have that all the time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I love the, the community we've built within, in, within the design and not to, not to get too far off track. I'll go back to where we were, but, um, like hearing people the other day post, uh, comments in there, like, uh, it was week one and like a lot of people made really smart choices on how their bodies felt and were like, all right, I decided to pull back on this today. And someone made a comment it was like, I'm super thrilled to be a part of a community that like is being smart with the training and not trying to like overdo everything. Yeah. And I'm like, sweet. Like we built this community with people that are smart with training like that. And it was just a, a cool feeling to see that, that they're kind of like doing that themselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, going back, so the, the OPT big dog community was, was really helpful with the CrossFit world. At the same time, I'm still kind of pursuing like other ventures of athletics that I want to be good at. Like I started to run some marathons and half marathons and I got super involved in the strongman world, um, with Chris Moore and like a bunch of the guys on site. So at CrossFit Memphis, there was obviously CrossFit classes, but Chris had a big powerlifting community there and these dudes would get rowdy on Saturdays. And I don't know if you've ever been to a powerlifting gym, but it's like, it's a different culture. Yeah. And like, you imagine, intense. imagine like Susie doing overhead squat <laughs> fundamentals and Chris is back squatting 800 pounds with chains, <laughs> 30 feet from her with death metal playing. I mean, it was Screaming. like the wildest environment. And I just, I mean, with energy, like yeah. I just get drawn to it and I got, pretty involved, like training with those guys and learned so much about strength from them. Something that like really not obviously like technique, powerlifting, strength progressions, but more like belief on what it takes to, to be strong. And I think that that was a lesson that is something that I will never forget is having Chris as a coach. He was an amazing coach, a person that did such an amazing job of instilling belief in you, which is like such a powerful quality as a coach basically teaching me how to be batshit crazy and like expect to get something done. Yeah. Like going into it being like, I expect to lift this instead of like having these preset expectations of like, okay, well he's really strong. So I don't know if I can handle that, you know, and so forth. So really amazing experience there. Like being able to train and lift with those guys and like more notably just like doing like stone work. I don't know if you ever had any experience like lifting stones, but it's the most like primitive fun feeling in the world when you lift um, a object that heavy and platform it. It's just like, it's so basic and like raw. So rewarding. Yeah. And it's just like, and it's just a cool feeling and like lifting with those guys was a blast back in the day. Sweet. So that, that led you into like, when did you have your breakthrough experience and to like, what was regionals at 2012? Like before 2013, was it just like a progressive rise up? Yeah. I would say a couple more years of hardship basically. So, um, hardship, hardship, like, <laughs> train, I, that sounds so cheesy. My life was, so my life hard. is, there's no serious hardship in my life whatsoever. <laughs> Training experiences that broke me and made me better. Good. Um, 2011 was, um, a, a tough experience in terms of like getting, I was going into regionals and, um, really had no name yet. People didn't expect anything. And I went in and I put up a couple of really good events and was like, I think in first or second all weekend with Dan Bailey. 
and had one really bad event. Everyone remembers this event in 2011 where it was like the kettlebell swing event. Oh, they call it the AJ God, Moore event. Yeah. And uh, I had so many no reps in that. Yeah. It same made, here. Turned me off to the sport. Yeah. A that, little bit. Yeah. I mean, there were so many things about that weekend. Like there was a thruster ladder and I remember you couldn't move your feet. Yeah. Which is fine. The, that was a, it was a hard rule to judge. I'm like, why would you do this to judges? You're yeah. just asking for so many things to go wrong. But I remember like in training hitting 275, mm -hmm. like, on the regular and I get to like 255 and I lock it overhead and the MC Travis uh Badgent was yeah. like he got it yeah and I like throw the bar down and the judge is like no I didn't call it yet like no rep oh, and I was like wait no. yeah, everyone <laughs> saw it and they were like no and they like didn't count it and I was like what the fuck just happened no. <laughs> yeah so it was like that was like but again like little things like that in competition, especially in CrossFit are so important because you could let that ruin the entire weekend. And I started to, like, I started to kind of dwell on it. It was like, this is unfair. And like, I did this in training and like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like good competitors, they don't care. They just move on. They do better in the rest of the events. Good competitors and those that are going to qualify are just going to keep doing better in the rest of the events. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So moving on that weekend, I'm, I'm still doing well in some of the events. And then we get to that the, the kettlebell swing one where like the rule, do you remember that rule? Which the one? The bottom of the kettlebell. Oh, had it to had be, to be perfectly straight up and it down. It would be like horizontal to the ceiling yeah. is what they were like telling yeah. judges to look for, which is like, what? It's yeah. crazy. But there's pictures if you go back of me doing the event and like I'm kettlebell swinging at like 410 on the clock. The clock's in the background. Flip through a few more pictures. 1213. I'm still kettlebell swinging. Yeah. I, I did that next to Brandon Phillips Yeah, and he, I think he did a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That BP. I think he did a hundred unbroken and I got, I, th I think it was like 50 no reps and I knew my judge. He was yeah. actually a coach from a gym and I was like, dude, what do you want? Like my arms are completely <laughs> straight. If the bell tilted just a little bit in one direction, they're like, no rep. It's gotta be perfectly straight. I'm like, who created this rule for yeah. a standard? Yeah. I remember there were points where I'm literally like pausing it <laughs> overhead and I'm like pushing my hips forward. Yeah. It was brutal. And, yeah. uh, I mean, unfair judging, whatever you want to call it. I was not prepared for that workout yes. and it beat the piss out of me. I remember there's a video you can find on YouTube of me just dead finishing this workout. There's like 10 reps left and I'm, I'm completely blacked out at this point. And there's a point where I finished the last rep and the judge calls it a no rep because I like let the bar fall behind me. I get back up. I try to squat snatch it. I actually miss a 95 pound squat snatch. I'm so gone. Mike the, snatches over 300 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> frame of reference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I dropped the bar on my shin and it gushes my shin wide open. Uh, I got to go to the hospital at night and get like 12 stitches in my shin. Uh, I didn't sleep that night. I mean, it was just a rough, rough ride that night or that weekend. I wake up the next day and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to finish. So I, I go buy a shin guard at a sporting goods store and I like tape it around my shin. I've got this long line of stitches and like I'm doing like touch and go snatches and Amanda <laughs> and muscle ups with a shin guard on. It was, anyway, it's like, it was, a, it was a good experience of like my lesson that weekend was one, like, just because you do things in training doesn't guarantee you anything when you show up Two, things are going to be unfair. And like, it doesn't matter. Like you have to just like keep going with it and just focus on the rest of the events and not carry it with you. And then three is like, just don't ever quit because I could have easily just been like, well, I have stitches in my leg. I'm easily done now, but I don't feel like I would have learned a lot. I actually ended up still finishing pretty well in the event. And like looking back, it's like, dude showed up with a shin guard and ended up finishing still like seventh place or something like that. And like, I think you just learn a lot. Yeah. I mean, you did six workouts instead of four, it's 150% of your competition volume, basically that yeah. you, your experience that you've gained by just doing those extra two workouts. I think a lot of times people don't like, we have it commonly people won't go to an RX division because they think they're an elite athlete. And I'm like, but yeah, if you want to get better at competing, just go win, like go practice winning then go yeah. and just get on the floor and just deal with that experience and your pacing and your food and adversity and no reps and all the stuff that comes with becoming a better competitor. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th I think walking away from that, that weekend, even though it, you know, based on how it sounded, it wasn't a great success with my goal of like finishing. I, I kind of was going into that weekend, like still not fully believing that I like, I was capable of doing that. So walking away from that, I was like, dang, dude, I was like right there the whole time. Like, hell yeah, I can do it hundred percent. So like, that was like, uh, such a motivating experience for like the next few years in training. That was 2011. That was yeah. 2011. So going into 12, things just got tighter. Um, I got more cleaned up. I was following 
um, the OPT blog at that point and just consulting with tons of people and just reaching out and just trying to just sharpen up everything I could and learn as much as I could. Something that I would want to bring up, if I remember correctly, that's when you were buddy, like partnered up with Shep all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you had like a training partner and I y'all did. were all, like always attached to the hip and he was pushing you and you were Man, pushing Man, that's him. an episode we should have is just like the importance of training partners. And, and this might sound super selfish, but I don't think it's a bad thing to mention is like, if someone has the pursuit of being an elite individual, you kind of need that sidekick, whether or not they're like at the elite level too, you need someone that's your yes, man. That's like yeah. always there is super down to just do whatever. And having one of those was like super important. Yeah. Like Shep, poor guy. Like I, I'm Shep's talking, tall dude, I'm talking yeah. about him. Like he's gone, he's not gone, <laughs> yeah, he's but not we, I almost killed him in some of these sessions. Like he, but he kept showing up and yeah. like just having that partner in crime there is like so helpful. Yeah. I think also too, it's very easy when you're by yourself to start talking yourself out of sessions or to start getting down on like, all right, I'm, I'm beat up. I should take the day off. But when you have somebody like that, that'll hold you accountable and be like, Hey, let's do something like, yep. let, you know, let's adjust it to this. What can you do? Yeah. That just allows you to kind of have a little bit more belief and resolve when things start to get hard. Cause they yeah. always get hard in training. Like yeah. if you have a, a concrete goal, it's not going to be some smooth sailing ride. It's going to be some obstacles and some down periods. Yeah. I've just seen so many people that train by themselves, get done with something and, and be happy about it. And, and I think that's awesome. You should be happy with your yeah. effort. However, it doesn't guarantee that it was any good. Right. Yeah. So like having someone there next to you is just constant feedback on whether or not it was good. Yeah. You know, like that's so important. Like you can train by yourself, but if you're not comparing it to some numbers, if you're trying to be elite and competitive, like that's super important to have. All right. So let's fast forward to the breakthrough experience. Yeah. You've been training now obsessively from 2009 on. And when did you set the goal that you wanted to make the games? Like Two, right away? 2010. I like wait, 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 wait. We can't fast forward. Why? We got to talk about 2012. 20, oh, okay. 2012, you went to, 20, team, 2012 right? is a short story. It was a year that I decided I'm going to go to Africa. <laughs> Um, I went to Africa for like a month with some friends and that was in the middle of the open. So I was unable to finish the open. Um, so basically I opted out of going individual to take a year to just train team. And like, I think that was a really good break, honestly, because it sounds silly. Like, again, I'm, this is so far long ago, but like three or four years of like hard individual work going into another year of it, especially when you have like a close year, I think at some point, like you start to kind of need to change a little bit. And I've actually seen a lot of individual athletes like James Hobart is a good experience of someone who did a really good job of balancing that, of basically taking a few years of individual and then going team for a year or two just allows him to kind of extend and let his fuse burn a little slower. Yeah. So this was just a good year of, of having a break, having fun with friends and just training in a different style. And I think it just allowed my body to heal and rest. And I just was in less of a rush to, to improve on certain things. Um, to be on a team with your wife. Yep. Brandy is the first year I competed with Brandy on a team. She'd moved to Memphis. Uh, she wasn't my wife at the time, but Shep was on the team, the training part of that time. It was a good experience. It was awesome. Nice. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, so 13 was like the push year. That so was, now we're fast forwarding. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so 13 was the push year. This is the year where I 100% went in, and um, it was the year – I don't think there was really anything else that I was doing at that point. I it think was it was just hundred percent focus <laughs> I mean, on CrossFit. Everything it was in a, in a positive way. It was very obsessive, like very low social interaction, um, traveling to go on site at OPT to train a lot. Um, that's going, where we met for the first time. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But that was in, or no, we met, but way before nah, that. we met in like 11, I think at the Tathlon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 11 or 12. And that's when I started working with Brandy. Yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, basically all the funds, all the finances, everything was going towards this, um, this, this goal, this pursuit. And, and it started to pay off. I mean, I was feeling better. I was fitter. I was just excelling on certain things. Um, as someone who got to watch this, he really did come in cause I was there in 2012 or tw into 2011 through 2013. And you would come in and like, you would know he meant business. It was like, he wasn't coming in to play. He would be friendly, but like it was all hands on deck. Like yeah. Get to it. I think that's something common that you see is like, a, there's a different level of dedication of somebody that's fully committed to a craft. And almost always, if they put that level of commitment in, it has a big payoff. It might not be like you had your experience where you broke through and you made the games. And there's a lot of people that probably committed just as much that didn't have that. Yeah. But I think the reward of that level of discipline and focus teaches you so much that in hindsight, 
if you know, you remove yourself from the feeling of failure, you almost always come back to that memory and you're like, oh, that was worth it. I learned so much about myself and grew as a human and built pride and self-confidence and all sorts of tangible things that you carry with you in your life. Yeah. I think, I mean, that level of dedication can show up in a bunch of different avenues. If someone has a goal of hiking the Appalachian trail, that takes a ton of commitment and financial dedication and lots of things that you basically have to sacrifice to get it done. Is it helping anyone else in the process? No, it's probably a very selfish thing to do. However, it's your goal. It doesn't matter. And I mean, if people believe in you and support it, that's always, that's going to help. And at that time having like a support crew around like family and friends, like everyone was like cool with that. Right. Like everyone at the gyms were really cool with, like I had different friends that had equipment in different gyms. They were like, yeah, yeah, come by whenever and you can use the ropes, the high ropes, whatever you need. It's like having that level of support is like definitely something that's needed. I think when you're like in pursuit of that quest. So how was it, man? What did it feel like when you did it? Tell the story. All right. So regionals. 1934 set the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, fun year of workouts, right? Like I think it's just a blessing too with some of the workouts, just considering my history of like what type of athlete I am. Super heavy. Jackie, the opening workout, really fast, short kind of race, just like right up my alley. I ended up winning the first event. Well, hold on. How'd the open go that year for you? Open went pretty good. The, back then, like most um, elite athletes might remember that like the open was just like, the stepping stone to get into regionals. This was before yeah. it was like the level of competition where like they cut it in they half. They were still taking 60. They were taking like 40, 48 it was like or 48 or 48 or something like yeah. that. It was, it was pretty deep. So yeah. like not getting in wasn't like a high chance. So yeah. I, back then, like I was doing like training sessions before doing the open workout. Yeah. Like, it was like, way, were you repeating that year? I think unless you that, had to bomb it. Yeah. You had to like really screw up. But at that point, no, like I remember 13.1, I had the flu the week of, and I waited till like the last hour that I could submit the workout and did the workout and like, just dr like dragged through it. It was awful and was like still fine. Yeah. That was like the power snatch burpee one. Yeah. It's so different. Like the last year that there were regionals getting into the top 20 is like, all right, now almost everybody's having to repeat the workouts. Yeah. Even the best people. Yeah. Like, I mean, well, they cut the field in half. The field got better. It was definitely way more competitive, but at the sport where it was at that time, the open was just very different in that way. So it wasn't a main focus hindsight. Looking back, there should have been more thought into making sure I was in the starting top heat. I think I was, I think maybe 14, it wasn't like a main focus, but like that was really important because yeah. being in like the, the last heat to go is such an advantage. You already see times like we've seen that time and time again, like yeah. even though, you know, the workouts for regionals, like still seeing what everyone set, and like, what would the, what was the judging? Like, what did transitions look like? Like, how did it feel out there? Like you learned so much just watching a couple of heats. Yeah. So anyway, going back uh, to the start of that, that year, uh, I win the opening event, which was an awesome experience because that was like the, the kickstart of like, all right, now I can do it. Yeah. Let's go. And it was just like, from that point, it was forward momentum. I just felt confident all weekend. And it was one of those two that I had such a level of focus. I don't ever remember being that focused in a competition before where anything that was thrown at me, it didn't matter. I mean, there was like political shit that went on that weekend too, which I'll, I'll, I'll dive into here in a yeah. minute, which was, could be a huge focus breaker. But, um, at that point it was just like bad. I had a bad event and I didn't let it affect me. Like I had had in years past. Like I was like, whatever, just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. I didn't look at the leaderboard once the entire weekend. Mm. Not until the very last event did Brandy kind of give me a hint of like where I was sitting. And I was like, how did what? you manage that? Yeah. Discipline. Yeah. I mean, so I, you were up against uh, that year. What Asia, who else was on that? Roy Gamboa was there that year. Um, there was a guy named Paul. What was Paul's last name? Paul Smith. Big dude. Oh, big, yeah. Uh, Jason Hogan. Was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jason Hogan was there that year. He'd been a couple of times. So some pretty good competition. Yeah. Um, so a couple of good events finishing consistently in the top and some of them. And then, uh, the second to last event had the front rack walking lunge. And I remember, um, kind of separating myself across the pack on that one, doing pretty well on the shoulder overhead and going into the lunge. I tear my groin like with like 10 feet left. And I'm like, in a lot of pain, finish the event, whatever, but it's like starting to like swell up and like it's turning blue and it's like pushing into my other leg. And by this point, it's like one more event left. So I'm like, whatever, just tape it up. Let's just go. And it was just like squat cleans and rope climbs. Um, again, I'm not, yeah, it's just 225 pounds squat clean. With a twin <laughs> I mean, at that point when you feel like, all right, I know where I'm at on this. I just got to finish the job. Yeah. Um, you really don't feel much and yeah. I'm not trying to sound like super dramatic, but like it was a pretty high level tear. Like it took me three months to rehab from this, but 
I'm like hobbling, doing rope climbs and finishing how to figure out how to squat clean on like one leg to get yeah. it done. Luckily it was enough to help me finish. And I ended up winning the regional. Um, but going back to like focus, there was a point where, um, ah, the fuck it. I'm not going to dive into <laughs> it. Uh, let's All keep right. this a positive yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. So then what, what did it feel like? Did it feel like everything that you had worked towards or was it not as fulfilling and it was more about the journey? I think it was super fulfilling mainly because, um, yeah, again, like it's one of those I tell people, you got to be crazy enough to believe it can happen because like, there's going to be all these, I don't know if it's human nature or maybe some people don't have this, uh, this, um, constant voice in their head that maybe that's what makes them better champions. Maybe they have that and they're the ones that just get over it. But I think that you have to be crazy enough to just shut, like to shut off all the signs that are telling you reasons why something isn't possible. Yeah. Right. So this was just one of those good moments in sport where it was just like years of bad stuff happening, whatever you want to call it, hardships and training, suffering hours and training, just kind of coming to fruition to a really good weekend. And I, I don't know how many of those everyone has in their athletic career, but like in order to have one show up, you have to try a lot. Like you can't just do it one or two times and expect to have that perfect weekend. You have to compete a lot and you have to put yourself in a, a position to be successful many, many times. So that was the successful pinnacle of your CrossFit individual athletic career. Then from there, you went and competed again in 2014. Yep. You went and you did Wait, grit. what the fuck? You skipped over the games and you skipped over healing this. I was, here. I'm I host now. I was going to skip over the games <laughs> for Mike's sake, <laughs> but we can go into that. All right. Yeah. So you had to heal the groin. Why don't we end on the high note of winning an event <laughs> and then we go to the games. Yeah. All right. So... <laughs> Fast forward a week after regionals. Um, Can I just say that 2013, in my opinion, was like the hypest year of all of like it's CrossFit as a community. Like it felt like it was mm. building, 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 building. And then that year was the, and then it's only dropped. Like it's, it's dropped. <laughs> maybe it like leveled back out, but it was never more hype than 2013. Yeah. In my opinion. Was that Rich's three P year? Yeah. 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 His 14 was his last one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty epic too. I remember watching. Cause that was when Jason Kalipa was like, well, let's talk a little bit about the game. Yeah. Uh, the, the, <laughs> Fast forward, uh, leaving regionals, I'm, I'm pretty beat. Um, the groin tear is like really bad. It limited me for uh, on a lot of things training, but I was like, all right, well, I know it's going to probably be the games things I'm going to be really bad at. So let's just do as much of that as I can. Like lots and lots of cyclical work, like lots of running, biking. So I just did like a ton of triathlon training. I felt pretty tired and like weak going into it, but whatever. Part of it too was like, okay, this was a lot of work. This is what I wanted. Let's go compete and have fun. I would say if there was any regret that I had when being there, it was that I just was so concerned. I, w I wasn't very focused there because I was just too in awe of like actually being there and was yeah. like, okay, I, I just didn't really look at what my athletic career would have been like past that point of qualifying for it. Yeah. I think that's a good learning experience for people. Yeah, you were about to skip the fuck over. Sorry. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> well, it's a good learning experience for goal setting yeah. is that if you set your goal, like your goal to qualify for the games, yep. then you do it and your goal never went beyond that. And it's like, well, you just qualified for this thing that you wanted to go. And now you have no expectations or yeah. target for that specific thing. So it's a, maybe an important learning lesson. Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, you don't want to look too far ahead and like, you know, count your chickens before they hatch. Whew, I thought, yeah. I, count that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if, if that's where a, a good coach would come in and like, maybe that was something that I just didn't have enough conversations with, with the coach at that time. But yeah, like the story stopped at that point. And like, after I hit that pinnacle or that goal or whatever, I was like, well, now what? Yeah. Like, anyway, so like, I'm very... I'm, I'm in, in, in CrossFit and doing these types of workouts. I'm highly motivated by like, like my ability to suffer is, is just has to come from a strong motivation. Like yeah. I don't just do it just to do it. Like I have to have a reason, like I would have to beat someone or for money or whatever it is. Yeah. Like anyways, that's the motivation. So, um, the games experience was fantastic. I remember doing the half marathon row, but like to the point where I was actually, you uh, were next to, I was next to Travis, Travis, on. the pacey yeah. warrior. Yep. And, uh, I can just, I can still hear Eminem blasting through his headphones when he's doing it. <laughs> spaghetti, <Yeah>. spaghetti. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty much. But during that row, I remember watching Jason Kaliba finish the row and like walking around, looking at everyone, like all swinging his arms. And I remember being like, what is wrong with that dude? Like he's fine. And everyone else is losing their minds. Like, yeah. like literally Dan Tominski's behind me, like screaming. Yeah. Like 
losing his shit on it. Like it was, uh, that was so impressive what he did. Did he roll like a sub six thirty and then held the sub one forty five for a he, half marathon? He or crushed something? everyone yeah. on that. It was just his, he was so impressive that year, his capacity, like his running ability, like everything about him that year. I was like, yeah. what is going on with this dude? Yeah. Um, it was crazy that he didn't win, but like, that was like Rich's kind of like crazy comeback year too. Yeah. I remember like Rich winning like the next four events going into the final day and a half to, to like basically seal his victory. But, um, yeah, like super fun year, great experience there, hard workouts. It was just really eye opening on like, man, like I got so much work to do to compete with these guys. And I just like, after that experience going into 14, it just was not the same. Where'd you finish on the leaderboard? Um, <laughs> I beat a few people. <laughs> okay. He didn't, say, he didn't get first, but he did get a fiance. I did. Yep. I won a fiance at the good. games that year. <laughs> That's yep. a good prize. Yeah. I mean, that, so much about that was the turning point. Um, le like I was saying in 2013, it was a lot of commitment and like, you know, financial stress, like all of it was just really tough for me. Like I felt basically very selfish at the end of it. I was like, all right, this was a goal that I wanted to do. And like, I used all my resources in the process of doing this. I don't think I have this in me to do it again. And like immediately after all that was done, I was like, I think I want to just start focusing on growing as a person a little bit more. And I'm not saying that other people can't compete at this level and grow as a person. Like Travis is an amazing example. A guy's got three kids and is still competing at the highest level. But for me, it was very difficult. And I just felt like, all right, I need to start growing in other areas of my life because the fulfillment has been reached in this and I just want to start contributing to do other things. And that's when coaching became more of a career. I uh, proposed to Brandy and wanted to start a family. And it was just a weird transition at that point. And it, be, it was actually a very difficult process trying to change that identity a little bit because you have this identity of being full-time athlete going into like, all right, that's coming back now. You've got to swallow the ego a little bit on certain things and time is just distributed differently. Mm -hmm. So what was 2014 like? 2014 was, a, again, a, a good training year d dealing with some injuries. Like the year of 13 just beat me up. Like I had the groin tear, then I had a sports hernia that I dealt with a lot. And just for the, for the first time, I'm starting to experience like burnout and like over, and being like overtrained, like overreaching a little bit. And I just think it comes to me not taking a long enough off season. Like I remember getting back into like really hard training, like a month after the games with select movements. Yeah. And I was just like, I remember even Michelle Kinney at that time, um, which was someone I didn't bring up like in some of the training process, but she lived in Memphis with me and was, um, we trained together a lot and she was like a really good influence because she's like, she was a very dedicated athlete and was really good and competed at the game several times. So it was like really good to compete around her and train with her. But she, I remember her saying like, dude, what are you doing? Like, like you need you're getting after it. And I remember being like, I mean, it's been a month, like yeah. let's go. But you look at, you look at other sports and like, I mean, they take off seasons, you know? Yeah. And like, that's something that we, um, I mean, I don't, as a coach, I like really push that with my athletes now, but like athletes in the sport of CrossFit, like that's really difficult for them to do. Well, it's also really difficult when you don't know what the season looks I like. Know, so yeah. I, I did hear that there's some move to make a more concrete season, which I think would help with that. Cause it would be nice to take <clears throat> four months away from training, just doing skill work and yeah. general fitness and getting outside and keeping the love for the game for longer. Yeah. So you don't burn out. Yeah. So 2014 was a bit of a transition year. I mean, I, I'm having to start to pay attention to my body a little more. I'm trying to deal with mental stuff and things just, just things that just weren't there you know, a couple of years ago, like in the years leading up, um, you know, so change tr training is starting to have to change. I experienced with a different, a uh, couple of different coaches kind of like felt out, um, what people know and like what they might know about basically like a more advanced training age. Yeah. And eventually I ended up working with you. Yeah. I think we started in 2014, right? Or, yeah. I think it was right after that. Yeah. Um, it was, me and Brandy were talking about your adductor and how long you'd been dealing with it and what you were doing. And yeah, I think I just shared some ideas with her like yeah. here, here's, and then that's when we kind of started collaborating. Yeah. I mean, I think you had kind of had that, a similar experience in your training career where I, I always look at ath some athletes, their fuse burns faster than others yeah. in terms of training age. Some have a really long drawn out fuse that burns slowly. And I think they'll all hit the same problems eventually. It's just stretched out over yeah. a longer timeline based on good principles or physiology, whatever you want to call yeah, it. And I think some of it too is just intuition. Like I look yeah. at how, like even just if you look at the personality of somebody like Froning, he's very like 
methodical. He doesn't seem to overstretch himself. He doesn't slow seem to burning train. fuse. Yeah. Like just as a human. Mm-hmm. And then like when I was in it, I was like, I got to get fucking stronger and jam my it's head. Like into the wall. Yeah. It's like, you're just an idiot. Like <laughs> yep. that. So that like, it makes sense that that process was constantly running my head into the wall and yeah. creating those, which were great learning experiences. And I think set me up to be a, a good coach and very empathetic to yeah. be able to work with people that were in your situation. Cause I'm like, Oh, I've been there. Like yeah. I, I know what to do. Cause I was there and I got out of it. I figured out how to redevelop a self concept and get back into training and find joy in the process of being in the gym. So yeah, there were positives from it. Yeah. So 2014 was a year of learning for sure. I mean, I was still pretty competitive. I think I, I went to regionals that year and missed it by like a spot or two really, really bad performance. Like, um, for multiple reasons. One, like training was just different. I went into it like so powerful and strong and I did not feel any better at what I feel like my limiters were, my weaknesses were. I wasn't were. coaching you at regionals. No. All right. <laughs> you had to make that <laughs> Don't put clear. that on me. <laughs> no, like I, I mean, whatever, like you could call it the coach at the time. Yeah. I, I still think like it's my own responsibility to step up and be like, I mean, I was following orders, but yeah, at the yeah. same time, it's like, you got to have a little bit of your own intuition as an athlete. And like, you've been doing it for, for yeah, six so years. My own responsibility. And part of it was just like, you know, like I just didn't have the same drive anymore. Like I was doing it because I was doing it. And that's what I had done for years. Not because I truly wanted to anymore. Brandy got injured at regionals that year. And like when she got hurt, she fell from the ropes and tore her knee. She tore her ACL. Like my weekend was done. Like I was just in concern mode. And like, again, not using her as an excuse, but like I could tell the level of focus was very different. Whereas yeah. the year before I probably been like, are you good? All right. I got to focus on this. Like, <laughs> but now I'm like, shit, I got to take care of my fiance. Like, yeah. you know, someone I care about, they got hurt in competition and she's very scared. Like I gotta be there. So it was just, it was just different. And then that just kind of cascaded into, um, just kind of falling out of love with it. And I, I just didn't know how to come up with a new reason to love to compete. Um, I was very unequipped for that. Um, but then this thing called grid comes out, <laughs> oh, oh baby, <laughs> which is just a, another beautiful less beautiful long line of lessons and training. <laughs> yeah. So many things about this. I learned about my body and training yeah. in general. And, so. and just about sport that you can't just like make up a sport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th- this sport poof yeah. appears all of a sudden it's got all this money, this visibility it's drawing all these yeah. athletes in. And it seemed like this cool, the coolest idea at the time. And it was super fun. Should we explain, I mean, there might be people that are in CrossFit now that have no idea what grid was. Yeah. Qu- quick. Just like quick. As a former overview. team owner, let yeah. me <laughs> <laughs> jump in, Chris. Oh, <laughs> man. So grid, grid was basically all the short CrossFit events that you see that are super fun to watch. They take like those and do 10 of them in like the course of an hour. On a team. On a team. With like, like movements were like yeah. pistol jump over a, like a one foot hurdle yeah. or Back. Hang hang power cleans at two sixty five yeah. or uh, backward roll to supports back, on rings. Yeah, back, yeah. back burpee backflips. Yeah. So think of all the circus acts that you see those people do that probably aren't the most rounded CrossFitters, but are posting crazy shit on Instagram. Yeah. Here's a sport where they can all just highlight that and showcase it. Like yeah. you know someone that's a mutant with a barbell, yeah. they get they sh- got a they, spot. Yeah. Dan and, Nichols and they were going to pay these athletes. They're going to pay us. So yeah. they were flying us out to do training camps and we were getting paid to basically do these races. It yeah. was like, it was awesome. Yeah. And it was a push in a direction of making the sport professional, which everyone was on board with. Yeah. The problem with it was a couple things, a bunch of things. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Let's just talk Let's about just the training the, side just of the, it. Yeah. Just the, the sport and the training. Yeah. The, the training side of it was that here's all these expectations that you have to meet in these races to do these certain movements, like thruster ladder up to 315 and uh, 10 hang power cleans as fast as you can at 245. It, it was a massive jump to training expectations that a lot of people were unprepared for and untrained for and super intense environment. I mean, you, we, we were going to these training camps and we were prepare, preparing for these races. You knew all the races ahead of time. So you trained them, you worked on going really fast not a lot of science behind resting, deloading, tapering. We would go, we had one week to basically do the best we could to get in shape for them, do them at full speed and hope that your body holds together. And it didn't, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Some, there were some elite so, athletes. I like, think Noah actually got better as a CrossFitter doing that because it made him have to work yeah. on like going faster, being stronger, being more powerful. And he yeah. was naturally on the other side of it. Yeah. I mean, then you have an athlete like me where it's like, it's all the stuff I'm already kind of good at. 
So we just did more of it and dug really deep and like, man, I, I was experiencing body pain that I didn't know was possible in yeah. training. Like I remember waking up every day and just crushing ibuprofen. Yeah. Like it's, I and mean, just covering myself in Voltaren gel and like all these different like lotions. I mean, it was just, just to go out and max out my clean and jerk. Yeah. Sound the horn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was a dangerous time to write training programs. I remember some of the sessions that I wrote, oh. like to try to prepare you to be the person that was the starter in yeah. one of the races. I'm like, wow, this is the race that you got to prepare for. I'm like, all right, well, yeah. like I'll write a session to help you do it and getting your results. So yeah. it's like, man, this just seems wrong. Yeah. I mean, it was weird. It was when the first time I'd experienced like feeling depressed and training, like, like low libido, like all these things that you hear about. Like if you like read textbooks, yeah, yeah. overtraining, yeah, overtraining, yeah. all these it's things, like it's like a picture check, of you check, during check, check, <laughs> check. Yeah. And, and it was really tough because not every other, not every athlete felt like that, you know? So like you're on a team with people that are like, dude, what are you doing? Like step up and yeah. go. And I'm like, man, look, y'all want us, want us to train today. I need to go sit on the assault bike and spin at like 50 RPM right now. Like yeah. that's literally what I, all that I, my body is craving and screaming at me to do. So anyways, it, it left me pretty banged up. I would say definitely a good experience in learning, but like I had to really start paying attention and like reframe training and movement quality because it was also very exposing on doing high level, excuse me, high complexity movements without perfect movement quality. You just saw athletes like me break down. Like yeah. I didn't have the best squat positions, front rack positions, single leg mechanics, tearing groins, like yeah. things just started to show up. So I had to like really kind of strip away, um, uh, how I'm currently training. And like, that's where you came in as like a really great mentor. And like, I went down this kind of a rabbit hole in like the movement path and yeah. got, I wouldn't say I got into the movement culture, but was doing lots of movement sessions yeah. where it was like 90 minutes of movement work. I'd say it was a, it was more of a healing for you. Yeah. Like it was like giving your body the capacity to work in yep. and get your fire back. And then that kind of led you back into CrossFit. Yeah, it did. It was, it was definitely learning how to train holistically and, and being smart with my body instead of it just being like work really hard or rest. It, it couldn't be one or the other. It had to be training sessions that were helping you work in a little bit and kind of restore movement and energy. And because I mean, it was at the point where I couldn't do CrossFit anymore. Like yeah. I couldn't go hard in Metcons. It would put me, I would do one hard Metcon and it would take me six days to recover from it. My yeah. sleep would be off. My mood would be off. I mean, I was having such, I was having really, really bad sleep issues at the time. You, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I came out in 2015 to one of the training camps that you had. And I, I came in on Sunday and was like, you're like, how you feeling? I was like, I didn't sleep last night. Like I didn't literally fall asleep. I not for yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, my body was in this constant state of buzz, which it sounds counterintuitive. Oh, you're really tired. You could just fall asleep. It was like the reverse opposite. effect. Yeah. yeah. I was just like completely like sympathetic all the time. So yeah. anyway, you get the point. Yeah. I was pretty beat up and it was just such a powerful lesson because it just forced me into paying more attention to this type of stuff and learning about stimulants and how, how things affect me personally and my body versus what other athletes go through. Yeah. It's funny that, well, not funny, but there are some people that could have done all the same things that you did. And for whatever reason, their psychology, their physiology, they're just fine. They're just like, better they're just, humans. Yeah. Like they're just built more <laughs> resilient. Yeah. 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 Those are elite crossfitters. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and there's not many of them. I mean, there's probably yeah. more stories of people getting into your position with even less. I mean, it took you from 2008 to really 2014. So that's, six years yeah. of relatively intense, hard training for you to start to experience some of those things. I'd say the burnout rate of people that are like, Oh, I want to be competitive is much closer to like two or three years for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think so. I mean, I, I still consider, I was still training pretty smart. Right. Yeah. I think it was just, um, everyone again, like the fuse analogy, I think everyone just burns at a different rate, yeah. you know, like Everyone's candle is a certain length and you're yep. going to get, you're going to burn all through all of it. My candle's huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, Sorry, man. Uh, Sorry, everyone. All right. <laughs> so then you went into weightlifting, right? Yeah. So, um, kind of like my segue back into competition was, all right, I like Olympic weightlifting, but I've never really competed in it. Um, I'd done like one meet prior to that, but I was like, you know, I want to get back into something and this is a really good balance for me because I love strength work. I excel at it. And I think, something that's motivating for people is doing something that you do feel that you're pretty good at. If yeah. you're only training weaknesses all the time, like it's not, 
it's not super motivating. <laughs> That's how I feel. Doing CrossFit. <laughs> I think it's important to train weaknesses in CrossFit, but at the same time, it's like, yeah. to me, it's like, if I'm trying to get back into feeling good and, and training with aggression and yeah. intensity again, I want to do something I'm kind of good at. I learned that lesson the hard way as a coach. I, I prescribe a lot more of that now. It's like, make your strengths stronger and then make your weaknesses less weak. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely changed that way. My model of coaching with that, I used to only focus on weaknesses way yeah. too much. I've talked about that in other podcasts as well, yeah. but now I'm like, no, let's continue to help you excel at your strengths too. And obviously work on the weaknesses, but I think that it does a lot for your motivation. So yeah. got into weightlifting. It was really fun. You helped coach me in that as well. And like my, it's crazy. If you go back and look at the volume, it was so low. Yes. It was hard sessions when I would do them, but it was like one tough set of like, it would be like uh, squat, clean and jerk clusters, like 75 to almost 90% that we would progress for a couple of weeks, two sets of 10 front squats, and then like one pulling set maybe. Yeah. And then I would take like three days off. Yeah. It, it would was be like such a low session. volume. And each week I was just like blowing up in my strength. Yeah. So this is a good lesson for someone who has really good strength adaptation qualities. You pr like start with minimum effective dose and just space it out and pay attention because it did a lot for me. It allowed my body to recover. I didn't feel overtrained at all. I got like some na tweaks and nags just because yeah. I was like, I mean, I was heavy ass almost weights. cleaning 400 pounds yeah. and like I was putting up pretty good strength numbers at the time. But I mean, I was like really excelling with it and it was the training for it was super fun. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the mechanics of weightlifting. I got really passionate about the sport. I went and competed and did a couple of meets I was not super passionate about the meats though. Um, I, I just think with my personality and like my behavior type, I just didn't like the process of being there all day long and not doing a lot. Yeah. I remember you reporting that in. you were just like, this wasn't fun. Yeah. Oh, I was there me and Kurt went and watched them. Yeah. And, uh, we were, it was like a big buildup, like, you know, it's fun <laughs> to watch them go. And, you know, after someone competes, you want to yeah. just be like, good job, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and as soon as we like approached him after he was done, he was kind of like, well, <laughs> whatever let's go let's go eat yeah, let's go I to mean, Chili's. not knocking the sport yeah. at all like i mean it that was, was a good experience yeah. it was a good experience and like i was successful at the meet and like hit numbers that i wanted i just like i'm pretty honest about things that i like to do and what i love and like yeah. i just didn't love it so i was like all right like i enjoy the community of crossfit and let's start pushing to get back into that a little bit so fast forward um, I think that was like 15, maybe. Yeah. Cause you did the open in 16, but it was not, it was like, like <laughs> my first year coming <laughs> yeah. back into well, basically. At this point you're a podcast host now too. Yep. Aren't you? Yep, yep. Yep. Working for shrug, uh, took over hosting barbell shrug podcast. Chris was such a friendly, helpful person through that process. Because, <laughs> Always am, man. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. first That's few episodes, be good like for your confidence. Oh, it was so, it was so <laughs> stressful. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, obviously much better now. Yeah. Very clearly. Oh uh, yeah. Like how good <laughs> you are podcast string words together. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, coaching at that point is like really kicking in. And at that point, um, I had left the engineering job and started to pursue coaching full time, working for Barbell Shrugged, coaching people individually. And at, at, as the years progressed, um, the individual coaching just started to kind of take off because it was just the way of coaching I truly believed in. Like I wanted to have an impact with someone individually because I just like kind of getting in to the details and just like really seeing how things work. And it was just a style of coaching. I was just like more in flow with at the time. And then 2016, you offered us to come on site. It was a great opportunity because Brandy wanted to come out and manage CrossFit passion. You needed another coach on site. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Then you'd, so you, from a competitive standpoint, you were part of our team. Yep. What was that like? going from it was I, I thought I was done competing right um, but I came back here on site and with good training crew and good training principles it was almost like I don't know it was like I don't know how to explain it but something that I didn't expect to come back and happen again was happening again um, almost like a memory getting replayed so it was just a really really positive experience getting able to being able to go back out on the competition floor and uh, with with a group of people that I like really cared about this time and and people would ask, like, did you want to do individual again? And I was just like, man, like, I'm so over training by myself. You know, we talked about watching, like, the show alone. Like, yeah. it just felt, it feels like training in isolation to me. And, like, just the good feeling that training with people on a team going toward a common goal felt like uh, was just so much more fulfilling at that time. And it was just a good balance, too, because 
I was able to, to, to the amount of training necessary to be competitive at that level on a team matched with the amount of time that I could actually put in with my life at that moment, or, yeah. or at least what, with what I was willing to put in. Yeah. So you had a good life balance to support it. Yeah. So work-life balance was a concept that really I hadn't considered for years. And then I would say like 15, 16 or something I had to kind of like really dive into and help other athletes to kind of understand, like at some point you need to consider these things because if career and sport is taken, you need to have something to fall back on because otherwise you're lost and it's a very difficult process. So that seems like a pretty good peak. So you hit your major peak in 2013, went into a little bit of a valley, came back up, went on a team, and now you're back in a valley where you're competing against me in training. <laughs> <laughs> this is the real low point coming you're, down the peak. <laughs> that's you knocking on yourself. You're actually fitter now than you think. I know. Then and, yeah. and then I was when I was competing. I don't I don't I mean, I've I would say I'm equally as fit as what I was doing team the last couple of years, because I'm still able to hit certain strength metrics. The Metcon stuff is just more about volume tolerance for me right now. And just yeah. like getting back to more consistent training, but we just had a child. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our son, Liam, are you defending yourself? <laughs> I'm just saying that my priorities are, are shifted right now. And I've had this conversation with Brandon a lot cause he's got two children and he does a lot. So um, again, like just something that's always really cool to continue to learn along the coaching athlete lifestyle process is when you start a family as well, like half your time is basically gone. So yeah. you have to figure out ways to be efficient and make training count. When you go in it's gotta be focused and it's gotta be hard. And you just gotta be realistic with like what you can actually get done that day. Because when Liam was first born, I had a really hard time, like managing, I basically thought he was going to be born and I would just work extra hard and still have the time to do all the things I was already currently doing. And that was just leaving me exhausted at the end of the day. Like I didn't cut down on training. I didn't cut down on workload. I just expected to cram it all in and it was just not the best quality. So being okay with slowing things down, slowing things down a little bit and making them higher quality was just a hard lesson, but yeah. it's paying off. Do you have goals for this seat, like this coming open or are you just like, are you in it for fun coaching balance now? Like, right now, my goal is just to continue to be able to do the throwdown on a weekly basis and feel competitive in it, yeah. right? That's kind of like a loose definition and like not like a very concrete goal. But my goal, I think that that push, puts enough pressure in my training. You know, like I still like to be able to show up. And if there's a throwdown that has a max clean and jerk at the end of it, like I want to be able to like feel strong in that and be competitive on site. Like this is my, this is my crew and like my community. And like, I just want to be able to still play with everyone. And then moving forward, my training goals are to, once they start doing them again, if they do, um, I know, I don't know if they'll be called sanctionals, but I know that they will be, they will still have destination competitions. Like I want to put a team together with you guys and go to like Egypt and do one of those. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, Brainy and I both had the conversation that like, we don't have any aspirations to try and do like a games team, but we just want to go to some of these destination competitions, be competitive, hit it hard have a big training peak leading into it and then go somewhere on a fun vacation That's and do it. the competition that should be the traincation. Yeah. It's I mean, the competecation. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like those experiences are just so much fun. Like we had a blast competing on regional teams for two years in a row, which we didn't really dive into, but yeah. a couple of heartbreak years, like yeah. we missed it by a spot two years in a row, yeah. which was just like crushing. And I still am trying to find the lesson yeah. in that one. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the lesson is like, for me personally, it like, happens. Yeah. I think mean, shit happens. <laughs> but part of it is like, all right, like at this point competing against these guys, like you got to commit more, yeah. you know? And like, I just like what I was committing at that time was just is what it is. And, yeah. um, it was, that was part of the sacrifice to me of like balancing coaching and trying to train full time. I mean, I was in Nashville the weekend before coaching my athletes and then, you know, on the verge of like a nervous breakdown <laughs> leading in thinking like, I'm not prepared enough for my team going yeah. into the next week. That's just like something super hard to deal with if you are a really caring coach. So, yeah. uh, where were we? We're talking about future training goals. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I mean, um, specific movements and metrics, nothing really concrete because I just don't have that much control over my schedule right now. Like we're trying to help grow this child and we're both figuring out our own work-life balance. Brandy manages the gym and wants to continue to train uh, competitively as well. So like, that's a lot of hours, you know? Yeah. Um, but in the future, once we basically get him, get everything more stable with our, with our schedule, we want to do a team and start traveling and make that like a very consistent thing. Like every six months train for one and go do one. Yeah. Me, and, Brand, the world. me and Brandy are doing a team in the team series. You're doing the team series. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Um, she all right. picked you over me. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's not true. Um, as a, so you've been training in CrossFit for 
13 years, if you go, well, 12 years, I guess, if you go from 2008 Golly. to 2020 and some sport performance, I'm still, stuff. Bad at it. <laughs> I'm still not that good. Uh, I have some things that like some patterns of behavior, some lessons that I think could be given to people that are a little bit newer in the quest. What would you say that, I don't know if you could pick like three things as you just told that whole competitive story that you would tell people as they're going through their process that they could learn from. Um, you know, I have this conversation with masters athletes sometimes, so I'll try to answer that. I think have an idea of how long you want to do this for, right? Like it's hard to predict that if I would have started this, I wouldn't have told you, like if someone sat me down and said, Mike, like, welcome to CrossFit. How long are you gonna do it for? I wouldn't have said 13 years, yeah. but I think that once you have an expectation of how long this process could be, it can help you be okay with slowing things down a little bit and being patient with it and learning to love it more and having fun with it. Versus it being like, you know, ready, fire, aim all the time where you're just basically like seeing everyone's progress and you're just trying to cram it down the throat all the time, which is just like going to end up leaving you burnt out. And it's going to really shorten your, your time in the sport because this sport is, I mean, it's an awesome thing to do and to be a part of. It teaches you so much. Like the, the reason I love it is because of the challenge, right? Yeah. Like straight up, like that's what gets you out of bed every day and makes things exciting is like something being challenging. And it, if it gets to the point where it's no longer bringing you joy or fulfillment, then like something you're doing along that pattern or process is off and you just have to pay attention to that. So I'd say like have some foresight and planning, have patience to apply the work required to make that plan and have fun while you're doing it. We'll call that number one. Yeah. And number two would be sign up for the design. <laughs> <laughs> shameless. No, for real though. I mean like a uh, really good, uh, um, that's like a shameless plug, but yeah. like, I love our community in it. There's smart people. You've got a lot of coaches, but the community itself is coaching a lot of the people in there. They're, they're policing, if you will, basically yeah. like we've seen people call each other out, like in a positive, encouraging way of like, dude, take a rest day. Like yeah. do or, less dude, volume to yeah, get stronger. Dude, less volume. Yeah. You talk about how you want to get stronger, but you're doing Metcons all the time. Yeah. Like I'm proud that that's the community we've built. And I think that it's a really good program if you've got the adequate skills, but are wanting to start kind of like sharpening up a little bit, like your training process and getting smarter with it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Who is that program? If you, if they don't know who is that program for and not for? Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I was getting into. I think along your training journey, if you have movements and are at a point where you're kind of not seeing progress and the movements you can already do, but need some more like help and guidance and good training structure, especially with like year round plans, that's what the design is for. The design's for a competitor. You, yeah. You yeah. could have there, you could not have some of the skills because we have skill programs in them. But I'd say for the most part, if you have the skills of CrossFit, you're ready to take it a little bit more seriously. You want some competition, you want guidance from the coaches, that would be like a place that you could go. And to piggyback off that concept and make it less like of a shameless personal plug, yeah. I'd say that the principle there is is find a good community. Like yep. as Mike was talking. He's talked about so many people that influenced him and mentored him and that were good training partners. If it's not something that you're getting from a distance, the people that you surround yourself with in person and through the digital world are super important to your personal development. And that probably extends beyond the sport of CrossFit. There's just in life in general. Yeah. I mean, the, the saying that you're the average of the people you surround yourself with. I mean, I think like that, that can be um, a process that's necessary for some, because some people don't want to put themselves around people that intimidate them. But I'm like, if you want to be better at something, like get around people that challenge you, that will call you out on your bullshit, that will force change in your attitudes and your behaviors. I mean, moving to yeah, I mean, <laughs> for real, like the, the people on site here are, are, are like, there's so much truth to that. You know, like you guys all make me better every day and like not to get cheesy yeah. or ending, but, um, <laughs> it's been, I mean, it's been a growth process being here. So. Cool. Yeah. So gotta have three. Two. That was two. Yeah, yeah, that was two. What's the what was the question? Bonus toy. <laughs> yeah, the question was uh <laughs> like lessons along your journey that you would give to somebody who's a little bit less experienced that would serve them well. Community. Com did we <laughs> community. do community for both of them? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll jump on some. Drink lots of water. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say that uh, I'll add two to it. As I listened to Mike, there were a couple things that stood out. One of them was a very consistent reporting and analytical process on where he was on mm -hmm. his numbers. Like he talked about, even in his beginning process, he had 45 days that he repeated to make sure that he's measuring that he's getting better. And 
at first, when you're a beginner, you don't really have a great measurement system. You don't know what's required to be great, but you do know if you're a beginner, you have to get better at everything. So yep. pick some basic things and make sure you're getting better. Your times are getting faster. Watch your movements, make sure they're getting better. I've seen Mike go through his process and build education and build his weightlifting programs, his skill programs that are in the design. And they're so they're so meticulous and so broken down. And he applies that level of detail with his own training and his own reporting. And I think that's a marker of a lot of elite athletes. So I'd say having some sort of a process that you're writing your stuff down, taking your results down, referencing back where you were in the past can be a really helpful thing. Yeah. The details. I mean, it all matters. Yeah. If you think it doesn't matter, then you're not putting in enough effort. Yeah. Like all, it all matters. For sure. And then the the last one, which I think ties into our corporate seal of corpus animus is that he's going through a, a self-reflection process. So as competitive as he is and that he wanted to make the games, he also always made time for the people in his life that he loved and the other things that he wanted to do in his career and going to Africa and like all of these things that helped enrich him and grow him as a human being. I think we're really beneficial to allow him to do it for 13 years. Like if you get into a process and it's like, I just want to do this if I'm going to be a champion, like I, unless you're rich froning, Matt Frazier, like there's very few people that are going to have all the skills and everything required to make that happen. So if you go into it with just a singular focus, most likely from yeah. a statistical perspective, you're not the one in a billion athlete to do that, but you can still have a very fulfilling, rewarding career and journey. If you are going through that process of developing your entire self, your intellect, your spirituality, your emotions, just everything. I think Mike's done a pretty good job of doing that and talked about it through his whole history of sport development. Thanks, Max. This is very well put. Yeah. I think those little breaks help develop that hunger and keep the fire stoked. Cool. So uh, <laughs> what a great song, man. Oh, what a great song. All right. Well, to all the Corpus Animus listeners, now you know the man behind the mic, Mike, Mike McGoldrick, training think tank coach, my friend. Anything else we need to talk about? Mike's already plugged the design. <laughs> what else we got coming up? Throwdown series? Oh, yeah. Throwdown yep. team series coming up. Grab a partner. Get your ass whooped by me and Brandy. An in-person partner. You're going to do these workouts with the person. Yes. It's not going to be um, anything done remotely. Yeah, so. so basically, it's our normal throwdowns, but for three weeks, <laughs> yep. they will be partner related, right? Yeah. Yes. Yep. We'll have an individual See. option if you don't have any friends, but, yeah. but hopefully you find have a friend. friends. Find a friend. All right. See you guys. See ya. Uh,